Well, welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. My name is Lucas Suber, joined today by my friend Rachel Madel. How are you? I could not be better, Lucas. What? Could, couldn't be better. Wow. I could That's... not be better. Do you know why? Why? I know why. I have a guess. Because <laughs> my Eagles won the Super Bowl. Wow. I always thought that it was the superb owls that won uh, the, the Super Bowl. But, well, you know what's really interesting is actually I'm a temple owl. That's where I went to grad school. So, oh, okay. Well, full you're... circle. But yeah, the Eagles won. So I'm like on cloud nine right now. Now, now how, how about you, Mr. Chris Begay? How, uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, my wife is a Patriots fan and I'm a Bills fan. So I, but my cousins live in Philadelphia. I've been there many, many times. So I'm so happy for that city and for Rachel and for everybody. But you know who I think really won the Super Bowl? The Tide Ad commercial. Like, you know? <laughs> so good. Wait, wait, I know. Did, did you do a Tide Pod thing? Because I haven't seen any. No, 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 no. It's just, uh, you have to see it because it made you think that every commercial was going to be a Tide commercial the way they did it. So you'd be watching it going, is this commercial a Tide commercial? Is this next commercial a Tide commercial? It was just uh, phenomenal how they did it. It was, agreed. yeah, it was genius. And it definitely like spoofed every other Super Bowl commercial in a really funny way. So you have to watch it if you haven't seen it. All right, cool. Normally I watch all the commercials after the fact typically i watch the puppy bowl uh you know, going on. but my wife um wanted to watch the sound of music so that's what we did uh, <laughs> so um however I, I assure you that my um my, my ego and my masculinity is intact uh, i'm feeling well, strong in myself right now well you know what's interesting so i'm in la and but i'm from philly so of course i was just so excited that they made it to the Super Bowl, and then of course they ended up winning. But it was unlike I went to a Super Bowl party last night, and there were some Eagles fans there for sure, which was really exciting. But the West Coast East Coast difference in sports fandom is so stark a contrast. Um, you know, I I at one point looked over, and I'd say half the party was watching the game and the other half was in a completely different room doing nothing related to football. I was like, this would never happen on the East coast. You would never walk into a Super Bowl party, regardless if the Eagles are playing or not. And half the party wouldn't even be watching the television. Oh my gosh. So, but you know, that, that actually leads me into, uh, into our conversation, believe it or not. You know, we're talking about people that maybe are immersed in an environment uh, that is designed to support a certain community and yet turn their back on it and partake in something different. Um, now, we've had a theme recently. Uh, you know, we had another parent on recently. Today, we have a parent um, on again. And, and what I'd really like to talk about uh, both before and after her interview um, is, 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 is what that life is like, right? Like what, what's different about her life experience and her children's life experience that maybe uh, is not shared by, by her peers and their peers? Um, what do you think? I interviewed Erin Compton. She is a parent of 13 children, which is crazy. Uh, but she just recently, in the last, I think, year and a half, adopted two children from China, both of which have cerebral palsy. So they are AAC users, new AAC users. And she documents her experience on her YouTube channel. And she's just fantastic. I really enjoyed this interview. We connected actually through social media. I saw what she was doing and I really appreciated it. And she, of course, agreed to come on. And it's just, it's hard to really encapsulate what her experience particularly is like. Um, I can't imagine having 13 children. Uh, but even more so, you know, the challenges that you have when you are a special needs parent. And I think it's something that I see in my practice a lot. And it's, it's, I, I can relate to it, but I can't, I could never understand it because I don't have a child with special needs. But I think it's, it's interesting to think about all of the things that they have to do differently. Right. And it's not, it's not just that school experience, right? It's, it's, it's the process of waking up in the morning. It's the process of getting dressed. It's the process of, you know, preparing whatever medical equipment potentially that, that might be necessary or, or, you know, dealing with dealing with refusal, uh, dealing with you know, quote unquote behaviors. I'm not a huge huge fan of that term, but I think people know what I mean when I say it. You know, but then there's this whole other piece of, uh, you know, you know, one parent put it to me uh, very well uh, once, where she said, "What do I do when the school bus stops coming?" Right. 
And, and that's the question, right? Is that you have these parents that go to soccer or you have these parents that go to karate and then you've got a parents that go to the, the OT or, you know, the PT or the SLP or, you know, developmental psychiatrist. Uh, that's a very different experience. And it one, it's one that lacks the, uh, you know, the authentic social environment that other, um, you know, kids are being exposed to. And then meanwhile, we're doing intervention in school about social thinking and these other things, you know, um, there, there, there definitely is room for a more holistic model, I think, of therapy, but that's uh, maybe a, another conversation. Um, but, uh, but, but right. So, I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different, um, it's a completely different life experience, especially when, when those, when those kids do interact with their peers, they're, they're interacting with other, you know, neurodiverse peers, you know, they're not necessarily getting that model of, um, you know, expected behavior, quote unquote. Um, so it's tough. And I've seen some families do it really, really well. And I've seen some families fall into the trap of, you know, what I like to call a sped family, right? Where you maybe have that one student that is eligible on an IEP when they're six. And then all of a sudden you've got three other kids come through the system that are all eligible on IEPs when they're six or seven. And you maybe don't see the same behaviors, but that's become part of their uh, cultural identity. And I also think that, so Aaron talks a lot about the support system and finding the right support system because, you know, these parents have that shared commonality of experiencing similar things and finding that network of people to help bring you up when you, when you need to, you know, hear some encouraging words and to relate with you when, you know, you're going through something new and challenging. And, you know, Karen Owens, who we had interviewed a few months ago, spoke to it. Aaron spoke to hit to it. And I think it's just an important piece. Um, you know, as speech language pathologists, I think it's important, you know, obviously to teach parents about communication and support that. But I'm constantly trying to give my, the parents that I work with, those connections and those support groups. And, you know, there's so many amazing groups of people on Facebook, which, you know, I think is a huge network that you can connect with parents that have a child with your exact, you know, disability as your child, um, rare genetic syndromes. And the technology is so great because it's connecting all these people, uh, you know, who have common, have common uh, struggles. And I think that that's just a really big piece. I know, Rachel, that I, that's something I include in all of my trainings as well, is that, uh, you know, I give my spiel about uh, what language development is and, you know, modeling, but then I say, you know, go out and find your tribe out there because um, it, there are people dealing with this beyond just um, speech therapists, you know, or, or teachers. There's other peers that you might have, and the world has gotten so much smaller thanks to social media. You can connect, like you mentioned, these rare genetic syndromes where there could be maybe 12 people in the world. Well, these 12 people can now get together and talk about their experiences, which is there's no time better to be uh, in history than to be right now uh, where you could be connecting in this way. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, and I, you know, I've had that experience. I've known parents that have had that experience, especially when, like you say, you're talking about something that's very low incidence. Um, you know, I, you, you can feel so totally alone when you have that one weird you know, Pitt Hopkins variant, you know, and then all of a sudden you find 10 more of them and one's in Australia and you're able to Skype, you know, I mean, that's, the, you know, and that's a true story. That's incredible. Now, the flip side of that is that you don't want to enter into a community where it's nothing but war stories, right? Where you're, you're, you're going into this, uh, this sort of negative affect. And, and you could say that, you know, the onus is partially on you to turn that around, I think, um, you know, but I, I've been in situations like that where I've simply decided to discontinue. Mm-hmm. And, you know, also an important question that I pose to, you know, our listeners, you know, how do you find the balance, right? Like, I think that a lot of times these parents are just overwhelmed with all of the negative and it's just sometimes they need to celebrate some of the humor in their situation. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the show Speechless because I think they do a really good job of, you know, obviously representing what it's like to have a child with special needs, but also mm. just like how funny it can be sometimes. And to, you know, obviously detail what's, 
what's really relevant and important, but also balancing that with, okay, this is kind of funny. And I, I feel like, I feel like on Thursday we're, we're interviewing somebody from, from Speechless. I mean, maybe you'll have to, you'll have to wait and see. <laughs> it won't air for a little while, but yes, absolutely. I'm excited for that. Well, this episode of Talking With Tech is brought to you by Audible, and I am always excited when I'm able to talk about a company that I'm actually really passionate about. And let me tell you, Audible has saved me a lot of sanity as I commute around between different clinical sites. I bet that's true for a lot of you uh, as well. Um, So we got a pretty cool deal. Um, If you sign up by going to audibletrial.com slash TWT, standing, of course, for Talking With Tech. That's audibletrial.com slash TWT. You'll get 30 days completely free with a book of your choice to check out. Um, There's a whole ton of books on there, but I got to tell you, the one I recommend is called The Etymologicon. Um, It's The Etymologicon. It's by Mark Forsyth, uh, narrated by Don Hagen, who's actually also great. And uh, if that sounds really nerdy, and it is a little bit nerdy, um, just wait until you find out what uh, poppycock means in Dutch, or uh, perhaps pumpernickel, um, and you will understand that it's actually, it's, it's really not so nerdy after all. I don't know if I would teach those words to your students, but again, I highly recommend Audible. AudibleTrial.com slash TWT. We'll also have the details at tech.com speechscience.org. Check it out. 30-day trial. uh, No risk guarantee. Welcome back to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Madel, joined today by Erin Compton. She's a mom, she's a blogger, and she's spent the last 20 years being a homeschool instructor. She has 13 children, which is impressive in and of itself. Um, She just recently adopted two sons with cerebral palsy and has begun working with them on AAC and documenting the experience on her Facebook page and YouTube channel. Erin, welcome to our show. We're so excited to have you here today. Hi, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here talking with you. Absolutely. I just, I'm a huge fan of your Facebook page, your Instagram. That's actually how I found you. I love everything that you're doing. I think that it's a great resource for parents and practitioners. And I'm just really excited that you agreed to come on the show and kind of talk about your experience. Well, thank you. Um, We really just jumped into everything about six months ago. Some of our backstory is about a year and a half ago, we decided to start the adoption process from China. And China is actually a country that only has special needs adoption right now. Um, the, the children who are found are found because there's, you know, they've been abandoned by family for one reason or another. Um, and we knew specifically that we wanted a child who, who had special needs. So we, we found our son, Philip. And um, you're given some medical information about the child and you always have to realize that it may or may not be correct. It Mm -hmm. might be the whole picture, but most likely it's not. Um, And with Philip, it did list that he had cerebral palsy, Mm -hmm. um, but he was also in an orphanage with 700 other children. And so, yeah. That's a huge number. It's huge. And then just orphanage life is... um, you know, there are so many delays and so many emotional issues that can come from that. Um, a lot of the delays that we were dealing with, we didn't know if it was because we were learning a new language or if it's because of no one was ever talking to him mm-hmm. um, or if it was because of his cerebral palsy. So we gave it about a year after he was home. And then um, thankfully, we have a wonderful neurologist who said, okay, you know what? He's five. He doesn't have any words and we need to get him some help. And she referred us to a great AAC clinic in Nashville. And um, we just love the ladies there. And they set us up and referred us for a, um, an, a high-tech device. Philip uses the Indie from Toby Dynavox and um, Snap Plus Core first. And we're loving it. We also... At the same time, adopted our other son, Arthur, who's three. His medical file was not correct. <laughs> we were told that <laughs> we were told that he had had some liver issues, um, but that he had had some sort of surgery and that it was all corrected. But the day that he was brought to us and placed in our arms, 
he was like a newborn baby who couldn't even hold his head up. Um, we knew, yeah, we knew immediately that there was a lot more going on with him. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were fully committed to him and to get him the help that he needed. So it turns out that he also has (laughs) cerebral palsy, um, just a different type and is also nonverbal. And, um, it's worked out just really well that, you know, both of our boys go to the same specialists Mm -hmm. and are learning similar, similar skills at the same time. And so because of that, it's doable. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. It sounds like they're kind of at the same place, uh, communication wise and communication development wise, which definitely is helpful in in a lot of ways because you can kind of reinforce the same things, the same core words and things like that. That's right. So I want to go back. I want to go back just a second. What motivated you to adopt children from China? This is actually our second adoption. Mm -hmm. Um, Our first adoption was back in 2003. Um, Our daughter was from Haiti and we had just seen her photo online and really felt like somebody needed to do something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes you have to realize that you are somebody. And so we, we brought her home and it, she's just changed our life. Going to another country like that and seeing how people live and seeing how different it is here and how much we have really changed our whole perspective and our focus on what we wanted to do as a family. So when we felt like we were ready to adopt again, it, obviously both parents have to be fully invested and completely in agreement. Um, and so the fact that we, we both agreed and knew that we wanted to, it was, it was time to move forward with it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so how did you decide China? So we actually had looked into uh, foster care and doing mm-hmm. foster adopt because we knew that there are a lot of children waiting here in the U S but for our specific family, we weren't considered because of our family size. Mm-hmm. They cut off um, the qualifications at six, six children. Hmm. So that door was closed for us. Um, and that can be up for debate also. That'd be something that we would like to change. Yes. Um, obviously, our, our boys have done really well in our family. And it doesn't seem right to disqualify families on, you know, on the number of children. Yes, exactly. So we have friends who had adopted from China and they encouraged us to look into it. And um, it was really a good fit because, again, we were looking for children with special needs and they are a special needs only program. um, And uh, it was it was the right thing. Honestly, Erin, I mean, we need more people in the world like you and your husband. Thank you. But (laughs) just, you know, we just did what we needed to do. Yeah, no, I really, I really admire that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about your your family. You have thirteen kids. What is that like? We <laughs> do. Uh, we didn't start out with thirteen kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I got married young. Um, my husband and I knew each other by um, he was my brother's best friend growing up, oh. and. Uh, kind of knew each other through high school. And right after I graduated high school, we, we just decided we would get married. And our first son was born a year later. And we then had a second son. Our third pregnancy really kind of changed everything for us because um, we had a prenatal diagnosis of trisomy 13 mm-hmm. with our, our third child. And that was really a tough experience to go through. Um, we were told that he showed multiple signs for it through ultrasound, um, and we were prepared to, you know, best case scenario, have a child with special needs, um, mm-hmm. but most likely in those situations, the baby does not survive. So we relied on our faith through that and did a lot of prayer, and mm-hmm. our son was actually born healthy. And yeah. at that point, we realized that life was what we were going to invest in and continued to have biological children, but also adopting, you know, we feel like life is valuable in every form. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Karen Owens from We Speak Pod. 
I have seen her. Yes. So we actually just did an interview with her last week and she, her her and you, I feel like should definitely talk because you have very similar experiences, (laughs) um, very similar core beliefs, really admire you, you both because it's your, it's an inspiration really. I have always felt drawn to children with special needs and that's kind of why I do the work that I do, but it's just, I I just love your story and I'm really excited that kind of share it with the world because I think it's a story that needs to be told. Thank you. Um, Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about your experience, children who have complex communication needs. Um, What has your experience been? The good, the bad, the ugly? Sure. Well, for us, you know, we were not not exactly expecting this, but I don't know that any parent really does. Right. Um, and so our story is a little different, though, because we started with a child who's five and a child who is three instead of starting mm-hmm. with a newborn and then wondering as as they developed. So we just we've jumped right in and started educating ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, There is so much information out there, which is wonderful. Um, The internet is the best place to get support and to educate yourself. Um, That's what I've learned more than anything is that in the beginning, it's more about educating yourself than your Mm -hmm. child and then knowing how to advocate for them. Absolutely. Um, are there any, you know, resources that you found in the beginning stages that you thought were incredibly helpful? For me, it's been Facebook groups. Yeah, they're powerful. <laughs> they are. And, and hearing um, from other families and then also the specialists are very generous with their knowledge and, and encouraging. And if you're doing something maybe you shouldn't be doing, they're they're kind enough to point that out and um, you just move on once you learn how to do it better. Yeah, the the special needs community in general is very collaborative, encouraging, supportive. Uh, and I think Facebook is just kind of a tool to bring people together, you know, similar exactly. experiences and can share their experiences. And I just, I love that about the work that we do. And then, you know, even more specific in the AAC world, I think that, we're just trying to get information out there as someone who's a, you know, practitioner. I just want to spread, spread the AAC gospel because there's a lot to know, right. and a lot of misinformation out there. So I think the more that we can share and, you know, work together, the better, the better everyone will be. Absolutely. And even in these six months that we've been at it, we're already coming across some of the misinformation and it, it's hard to know what to do as a parent in those situations, especially mm-hmm. when you're working with a professional. You can't quite <laughs> step on their toes and tell them, look, yeah. <laughs> here's, here's what we would like to have happen, especially when you don't have the education to back it up. Mm-hmm. Um, just knowing what works for our own child and um, the research-based practices that do work over time it's hard to find the balance of sharing that with people without stepping on toes. Mm -hmm. Karen Owens speaks a lot about her core beliefs and that when we talked, her and I, we spent a lot of time talking about this is a journey, right? It's not something that happens right away. You kind of have to believe that your child is capable and that these systems that we have in place as far as modeling and, you know, all these things that we, we tell parents to do that they will work with time, but it's not always easy to make that leap. Um, I'm just curious, what has your experience been with, you know, presuming competence and have you encountered anybody that, you know, hasn't necessarily believed? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, We've had a, a great experience with presuming competence and, I agree fully that it's a journey and we're just in the very first steps of our journey. Mm -hmm. Um, We're doing a lot of modeling and, and I think outsiders wonder, you know, why are you just talking and pushing buttons and, and your kids aren't even like really pushing any buttons, but you just keep doing it. And, and for us, we're seeing results at home, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the things that they do in their own comfort and their own environment is different than what they're going to do in an office or out in public. I agree. And they, they have to do it first at home. Mm -hmm. That's natural for, for any child. Um, 
So for those who, who maybe might doubt, um, the only option we have is to just prove them wrong. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing and sharing our successes and cheering on our kids. And, um, you know, it's not new to our family. It's just maybe a different avenue of doubt. Um, we have 13 kids <laughs> and, and people look at our family and think we're out of our minds. Um, and we decided to homeschool them all. And same thing, you know, who are we to think that we can do something like that? But we have two that are now in college on full scholarships. And so some of the doubt is fading away. Yeah. And at times you just have to wait and let the results speak for themselves when the time comes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what you just mentioned about the comfort of your own home, I think that's so important to remember is that children need a safe place when they're learning new skills. Right. And you won't necessarily see it at school or, you know, out at the grocery store and all these places. Um, and I think that's why it's even more important to, for parents to support that home experience and for practitioners and speech therapists like myself to help parents, you know, help coach parents as to, you know, what aided language simulation and modeling looks like and how you can incorporate it into your everyday routines. Um, and I think that's just such an important point to remember is that it starts first at home. That's right. And at home, we've looked at it as just another language for our family. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were going to be a bilingual family, we would all want to use the other language and um, speak it as much as possible. And the same is true with AAC. And now I'd also love, because I've seen a lot of your videos and I love them, and we will definitely link to your YouTube channel and your Facebook page so people who are interested can go watch for themselves. But... I love how you, you make modeling a whole family experience. So I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit. Well, our kids um, just naturally, like the day the device came and we opened the box, you know, it's like Christmas and they, they're thrilled by the different sounds it makes and all the pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't discourage them at all because we knew how peer modeling works yes. <laughs> and, um, the fact that they were all interested and excited was just that much more motivation for our boys to get excited about it. And anything that they see their siblings doing, they want to do. And um, we just went with it and kept it going. You know, it's, it's so interesting how I can spend months trying to teach a skill to a child and then a peer comes in doesn't even overtly <laughs> teach anything, does something that I've been trying to teach forever. And it's like, oh, we got it now. You know? Right. And yes. <laughs> it, it's so, it's so interesting how that happens, but it's just peer modeling is powerful. We as human beings, I think want to, um, be accepted, you know, with our peers and mm -hmm. we kind of look to what they do and, you know, a lot of times emulate what we see around us. And I just think that children identify with other children, right? They're the same, they're the same Absolutely. Size. They say they talk the same way. So I just love that you're kind of utilizing that. Um, oh yeah. The yeah. Power. That that's a major tool in our toolbox. <laughs> love it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's, that's our goal for all of our children. Um, we want them to grow to be able to see beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to talk about, uh, there's a video on your Instagram, which I love, and it's Philip saying hi. Uh, were they his first words? <laughs> yes. Hi. He, we actually, we call him our mayor because everywhere we go, he's just waving and hi, <laughs> greeting everybody. Oh. He, he keeps us laughing all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the video that you're talking about may be the one where he actually put two words together for the fat, the first time. Yeah. And the two words were hi mama. <laughs> and that was just amazing. Um, the fact that he, he connected me as his mom was just, um, it's the best feeling. I can only imagine. And honestly, you, our listeners have to go watch that video because it is, it's very short, but it is so cute and so heartwarming. Um, I honestly, I've shown it to lots of people. I'm like, you have to see this little boy. I love him. I show them your page. 
I'm a big fan. Philip is just, he's such a cute little guy. <laughs> he um, is. He's so much fun and gives us so much to smile about. So most of our audience is speech therapists. And I would love if you could impart one piece of wisdom or information from a parent's perspective, what do you think that would be? Um, I would say maybe to, um, to listen to the parents and um, even be, be willing to ask the questions of, you know, what are your goals for at home and um, how can we work together? Uh, I think a lot of times therapists, they have goals that they have to meet. You know, there, there are the therapy goals and, and those are great and they're for a specific purpose, but there are also goals at home and to try to make those work together is just so important. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's the first question that I ask parents is what do you want to see different? If I had a magic wand and I could come in and change something, what would it be? And that, that, question is very interesting and it doesn't, it, it often gets answers that I'm quite surprised by, but it gives insight into what is this family motivated by? What do they want to see that change as far as communication is concerned? And how do I fit into that? How can I create goals that support what I know as far as communication development alongside of family goals and, you know, what a parent mm -hmm. wants to see for their child? Uh -huh. Um, let's see. I think we hit most of them. Do you have any other, you know, stories that you'd like to share? Any other points that we haven't talked about? Um, well, before we started, we were talking about just the perception of special needs in other countries. <laughs> yeah. Um, as part of our adoption process, we obviously went to China to get our boys. Um, during our trip to China, it was very obvious that their perceptions of special needs are completely different from um, ours here in the U.S., and we kind of assume that they're going to be the same worldwide, but they definitely aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and going through the adoption process, we learned quite a bit about why there are so many ab abandoned children there, um, and special needs is the number one reason why they would be abandoned. Um, it, they believe firmly in luck, um, just, just culturally, um, luck is a, a big part of their beliefs. And if a child has special needs, they're seen as being bad luck. And if a family continues to have a child with special needs in their home, then bad luck will continue to come on their home. Mm -hmm. um, also karma. Karma is something that, you know, people like to talk about, especially when it seems like maybe someone's getting what they deserve. Um, and usually it's if someone has done something that wasn't the best, then they will get what they deserve in the end. But children who are born with disabilities um, because of karma are seen as maybe having done something in a past life um, and that they have deserved this disability. And so treating them as inferior is... is um, it's acceptable. Yeah. And I, so I had an experience, I was in Cambodia, um, last year and it was eye opening. Um, I was doing a training mm -hmm. there for, and I told you this earlier, you know, they told me, Oh, like you're going to have a training for the speech therapist in the country. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. There's only seven. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Well, and I had heard in, in China, there are five, I, five in the whole country. Which is just, it's amazing, you know, to think about. Right. And then there's so many children with a need in those countries. Yes. Um, it's, yes. it's overwhelming, the need there. But anyway, I had this experience in Cambodia, and that was the, the hardest thing, you know, to swallow was this perception that if I have a child with a disability or, you know, special needs, that I, I deserved this life. And mm -hmm. then I'm not going to seek out treatment because this is, this is what I deserve. Um, exactly. That, that's the hardest part for me is that these children aren't getting services because this notion that, you know, I deserve this lot in life. This is karma and I have to live with this and I have to, you know, live with this, with a child and not, you know, give them the supports that they need to learn and grow. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we toured Phillips Orphanage with 700 children in there. And just seeing 
seeing the need in there will never be the same. Um, so it's exciting to know that at least awareness is growing and um, people are reaching out to, to train professionals in these countries and to bring help to these children. Um, definitely for the children who are there right now waiting, adoption is going to be the fastest way to bring relief to them. Mm -hmm. And um, we would encourage anyone who's ever thought about it to please seriously consider it and to know that the kids who are there are real and mm -hmm. there is real suffering. And the only way that they will get a voice in any way is to have a family. Um, and a mother and a father is a right. Um, mm -hmm. the, these children need to have homes and have families that will support them. What was it like when you brought, um, did you bring Philip and Arthur home at the same time or? We did. Um, they had never met before, but they were in the same province. And mm -hmm. so it was actually July 4th, Independence Day <laughs> that we, we met them and they became our sons. Um, and it took another 10 days in the country before we were able to bring them home. Um, but it was just, it was wonderful. Um, very difficult at the same time. Um, but we've learned that the things that are the most worthwhile are often the most difficult things that we do. Yes. Um, and our children embrace them all immediately from day one. Um, and they, they support them, they protect them, they care for them. And, you know, people always wonder what adopting a child might do to your own children in the home and how it would affect them. But from our perspective, it has only, only grown the people that they are and they're becoming better humans um, and just more aware of life beyond themselves. Absolutely. That's a really touching story. And I think that having that experience for your other children. There's no better way to celebrate individual differences than to bring a child with special needs and embrace them, you know, wholeheartedly into your family. Right. Absolutely. And, and we see things that we missed, you know, <laughs> now that we have, um, our sons and our family, we absolutely appreciate a different perspective. And we look back and go, how did we not see this before? But there are so many things that you just can't fully um, appreciate until you're there yourself. And being a special needs parent is one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, Erin, where can people find you online? Well, we're on Facebook. We're under lots of Comptons. <laughs> um, we, we're on Instagram now and doing some YouTube videos. We like to show a little bit about our family but we're also documenting our AAC journey and homeschooling. Um, so Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And we will definitely link in the show notes. I would highly recommend visiting her site, watching her videos. You do a lot of stuff with core words, which you know, I'm a big fan of. And it's just really great to see a parent implementing all these strategies. And I think that it's one of the hardest things. We kind of have a lot of information out there about AAC and implementing, but there's not a lot of videos out there that can kind of show families what to do. And videos were what helped us figure out what to do in the beginning. So that's why we've been really trying to make some of our own because I agree they're, they're great. And it only takes a few minutes to get a lot of information Mm -hmm. um, just as our sons are learning from modeling as parents, I think we're learning from, mo from modeling also. So, yep. um, just seeing what it looks like in a home helps us know what to do ourselves. Absolutely. Okay. So if you guys haven't already go to tech.speechscience.org, you can ask us a question. You can go to iTunes, find us, subscribe, leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. Um, again, Erin, thank you so much for joining us. What a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, welcome back to Speech Science. Um, I, I thought that was a really moving conversation. I think we've been very lucky to interact with a number of parents um, that are, uh, you know, have really, have really put themselves on the line uh, to, to take care of these, of these children that are in need. I think a lot of people will sort of look across 
look across this gulf, right? The, the, there'll be a, a stream bed, right? And on the other side, they see all these, uh, you know, children or adults with disabilities, and they'll sort of put a toe in and, and say, oh, I, I donated my $10 or whatever it is. But to, to really forge that river and to, you know, to go across and make a, a true difference, I mean, that's, um, that, 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 that's a test of a human being. And so um, my kudos to her and, and all my respect. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, not just what she's done that, that she's found in terms of solutions, but what, um, what can those uh, listening do to help? Um, well, I, I mean, obviously we can cut back to what we said already about the support groups, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I thought Aaron did a really good job of explaining that in the beginning, it's more about educating yourself as a parent than it is about educating your child. And it couldn't be more true. I think that especially with a new diagnosis, it's really, really overwhelming. And I think parents oftentimes just assume that, okay, I signed up for speech therapy, like now it's going to be fixed. And unfortunately, the outcomes for that perspective are not are not good uh, because, you know, as we know, the parent, getting parents involved in the process and educating them and then empowering them is half the battle because especially with the high turnover of speech therapists in school districts and, you know, things happen. You don't have the same speech therapist, you know, your child's entire life. So I think that parents are kind of the gatekeepers. So we need to empower them in the process and tell that to them. Right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I know that from my practice in the schools is that not just the speech therapists, but the teachers, you spend so much time working on getting the communication partners up and running and those communication partners change, except for the family where often uh, the, the, the parents and the siblings and the cousins and the grandma happens to be living with you or whatever else is going on in your life. You can spend time uh, educating those people because those will be the constants. Mm hmm. Yeah, you know, one thing that's great about that is that I, I remember, um, you know, when I first started many, many moons ago, right, since I'm, I'm, I'm one of the one of the young men uh, in, in the field, uh, you know, I would, I, I would go out to a parent's house and I would spend, um, you know, 45 minutes programming, right? And that's, that's not as necessary anymore, right? Um, you know, especially because in some situations, I can actually do that programming at, the, at, at a distance. And so what, what's great is that allows more time for something that I think is, is critically important, right? Which is, we, we have research that indicates that training of the circle of support of the child is the number one predictor of success in AAC, right? And then, you know, the second component of that is another big piece of our job, which, you know, some grad schools, I think, do a better job of preparing than others, which is the counseling component, right? You know, um, you know especially when you, you have a family with a new diagnosis or a family that, um, you know, is really struggling to, you know, to accept, uh, you know, I guess the developmental level of their child. Um, you know, a lot of that time is spent talking to the parents, talking to the siblings and, and you know, really helping them to understand, um, you know, the unique human being that lives inside their home. Yeah. And I think you're exactly right. The biggest piece from, I had a, I'll, I'll never forget this takeaway from grad school. I had not a counseling course, which I would have wish I would have had, uh, but it was actually a fluency course. And in that course, you know, obviously there's a lot of psychological uh, ramifications when someone has a fluency disorder. And we were talking about counseling and the biggest takeaway was it's not about talking, it's about listening. And I think that's the biggest thing is that, you know, we don't even need to give a lot of information to parents, especially right away. We just need to listen because that listening not only empowers them and gives them kind of an outlet, but it also informs where are they coming from, you know, what do they care about? Because a lot of times when you're starting out with a new client or a new student, you know, you really need to get buy-in from the family and there's no better way than to be a good listener. You know, Rachel, let me take that, uh, just to amp that up just an extra notch. And that is, I remember a story when I was a fledgling speech therapist, one of my first years, uh, a parent came into me during a, it was her, I was an IEP meeting and it was with her second child and uh, her first child had autism and her second child was now starting to exhibit similar symptoms. And she started to say, you know, she called me Mr. B, Mr. B, um, 
I don't, I just felt like everyone at the table was judging me. Like, why did you even have a second child? You know, and that had never even occurred to me. Like you have as many kids as you want. Who am I to say how many kids you have? But I, uh, the listening component is huge, but also internally, don't judge these people, accept the decisions that they've made and just work with them. You know, I think it's part of like who you are in your heart to not be a jerk. <laughs> you know, yes. That's a prerequisite to a speech therapist. Yeah. The nature versus nurture there, I wonder, uh, are some <laughs> jerks? I don't know. Um, well, I think, I mean, I think everybody who comes into this field is called here for a reason, right? And sometimes, sometimes it's because they're kicking and screaming, uh, you know, because of a, you know, a family need or whatever it might be. But, you know, the vast majority of the time, I think it's just really, really caring, loving people. And, um, and, and, and it's a blessing. I mean, I, I, I don't, I never wake up unhappy, right, to, to go into work, um, which is really cool. So um, I, I, I can't imagine, but uh, that, that she must feel the same way. Absolutely. And exactly like you said, I think that we get into this profession because we like helping people. And at the end of the day, even if, you know, we didn't make huge gains as far as, oh, they're using pronouns or all these things, you know, we helped a child or an adult become just a little bit better at communicating. And I think that that like, we can go to bed and we can feel good about what we did in that day. So that's just one thing that I love about being a speech therapist is that it's such a powerful thing that we get to do. Yep. Yep. We get to watch, we get to watch that trajectory. Uh, you know, and frankly, that's part of the reason why I work with, um, you know, with kids that are sort of on the, high, the higher impacted uh, end of things is that you, when you see those breakthroughs, Oh man, it's, it just, it sends, chills like we you know the last time we spoke we talked about my my ugly luke butt story you know and uh, <laughs> I, I i'm still the more i think about that i still get excited like three words i'll take it you know but, <laughs> and, but in saying that i do not at all mean to undervalue the very hard work that's being done um you know at, at other levels in seventh grade on on language on articulation on on crazy malocluded uh you know teeth and, and these other things um it just happens not to be my specialty so i can't uh, speak to it <laughs> um which maybe is why this is called talking with tech right um <laughs> Well, I, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, I really appreciate uh, Chris and Rachel, of course, uh, you, you joining me. I thought that was an amazing interview. So, Rachel, thank you for facilitating that. Um, if anybody would like more information um, about this, please go to tech.speechscience.org. You're also always welcome to reach us at tech at speechscience.org. Or, you know, honestly, the, the most active place anymore is our Facebook group. So if you, if you look for talking, um, talking with tech on Facebook, there's going to be a page and a group. Um, you know, the group has a pretty good number of people in it, and it's really quite active. So throw your questions in there. Um, here before too long, we're going to start doing some, uh, some, some live chats in there to, uh, to answer some questions in real time. Um, date to be determined, but um, if that's something that is, is really interesting to you, uh, you know, please let us know because we'll do our best to accommodate um, what works for you. So once again, this is Lucas Stuber for Talking With Tech. We'll talk to you next week. Um, before we stop the record button, you, when you introed or you outroed, you introed the outro, you said, welcome back to speech science. So I don't know if you want to do a welcome back to Talking With Tech or. Oh, I did. Matters. You mean at the very beginning? The beginning of the outro. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember what I said after that? Uh, no, but I think you could probably just say like, welcome back to talking with tech. And then yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And then I'll say the, um, well, welcome back once again to talking with tech. Um, I, I think that was a very, very powerful conversation. We've been very lucky to have, uh, you know, a number of parents come on recently and share their experiences. Done. Got it. Good. Perfect. Stop recording.